So today I want to look at something else. Some rules? Yes. And Bible interpretation. Another rule is scripture must be compared with scripture. And I think this is important as well. I think the first is very important, but this is just as important. Scripture must be compared with Scripture. And I want to go to 2 Corinthians uh, this evening. I want to go to chapter 2, verse 13. I'm actually going to read there from verse 10 to 13. It says, that says, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 10. But God hath revealed them unto us by his spirit. For the spirit searcheth all things, yet the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of man which is in him? Even so, the things of God knoweth no man but the spirit of God. Now, we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. Which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. So we always need to compare spiritual with spiritual, scripture with scripture. If we try to do it any other way, we won't be able to understand the truth. And he is very, the, the scripture is very clear. We have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. So God wants us to know the truth. Amen? He wants us to be able to interpret the scriptures the right way. So we need to compare scripture with scripture. That is why it is good to have a Bible with cross-references and to use treasury of scripture knowledge, which has hundreds of, of cross-references. I use that quite a bit. I love to use it, and I was taught this by Pastor Wolf, how to use the Bible and the cross-references so we can compare scripture with scripture and see what the meaning is behind the teaching of it. That way we don't get confused and we don't get a wrong doctrine. Comparing scripture with scripture is essential for developing sound doctrine. If scriptures interpret it in an isolated fashion, the result will often be a wrong interpretation. And note, I said often, not always, but often it will be the wrong interpretation. For example, and I want to just see a couple examples here. Now I'm going to go to 1 Corinthians here a bit. 1 Corinthians, and I want to go to chapter 9. And, uh, but I even touched on this a little bit last week, and, and David here probably knows this as well. As I was growing up, I remember my parents, because they weren't saved at that time, and I remember them telling me, you know, you have to stay with what you have learned. The Bible says this. And they used one word, uh, one, one verse, and they took it out of context. So what you have learned since you were small, you have to stay with that. And I remember telling my grandfather, uh, before he accepted Christ, he was 93 years old already, and he said, you know something? I've believed what I believe all my life. I believed it for 93 years. And I believe what my parents taught me, that I have to stay with what they taught me, what I have learned. I have to stay with that. And I told my grandfather, and what if it's wrong? What if it's wrong what your parents believed? Are you willing to risk eternity? Keep on believing what you believe and not accept what the Bible says and hold. You want to base your faith upon one single verse? Or do you want to know what the rest of the Bible teaches? And I think that's important that people understand this. We can't just pick out a verse 
now this is where we're going to base our faith upon and not compare it with other scriptures. We need to compare scripture with scripture. But I want to look at here at 1 Corinthians, and I want to look at the life of Paul a little bit today. In uh, chapter 9 and verse uh, 22. I'm going to go to verse 22. Well, I'm, actually, I'm going to read again from verse 19, and we understand a little bit better that way. It says, For though I be free from all men, yet have I made myself servant unto all, that I might gain the more. And here Paul is speaking. He says, and unto the Jews I became as a, as a Jew, that I might gain the Jews, to them that are under the law as under the law, that I might gain them that are under the law, to them that are without law as without law, being not without law to God, but under the law to Christ, to Christ, that I might gain them that are without law. To the weak became I as weak, that I might gain the weak. I am made all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. And this I do for the gospel's sake, that I might by, be, might be partaker thereof with you. Now I want to look at this here. Now what if we look at this and we don't compare this with the rest of the Bible? And there's a lot of people that do this. And that's why I wanted to talk about this a little bit today. There's a lot of people that say here, okay, Paul says, become all things to all people. Paul does say that. We just read it. He became weak to those that were weak. He became as without law, but yet not without law. He even explains that there to those without law. He became as under the law with, to those that were under the law. So, yes. How do we interpret this? Paul says, I am made all things to all men that I might by all means save some. If this is isolated from the rest of Scripture, one can assume that Paul, Paul was willing to do anything to reach the lost, including adopt their lifestyles. And this is what I wanted to look at. There's so many Christian groups I should say this is a doctrine that is popular among some Christian groups, and I'll say it this way. You know, Paul says that he becomes all things, so if we want to win other people for Christ, we have to become exactly the way they are. And by that they mean we go where they go, we do what they do, we speak as they speak, so we can have chance to speak to them about Christ. That doesn't work. That's not what Paul means here at all. And, I wanna, and that's why I want to compare some scripture. I don't think it'd be wise for me to go to people that still do what I used to do. Drink, go to bars, and drink with them, and just to try to win them for Christ. I don't think that would be very wise for me to do. Amen? I don't think it would be. And I don't think that's what Paul meant when he was saying this. I think he meant, yes, he went to them. He became part of what, what they did, but I don't think he practiced the sin they were practicing. He was still telling them the truth. And we see this through scriptures. Paul went to everyone and he told them about Jesus Christ. And even of those that were under the law, he told them, look, look you need to accept Christ by faith because even though you're under the law, you will not be able to go to heaven if you don't. He still told him the truth. Amen? So, but I want to compare here a little bit. And I want to just go to Galatians. You know, when one compares Scripture with Scripture, we find that Paul did not mean this. He did not mean that we should do whatever they do. For example, Galatians 5.13. Let's go to the book of Galatians, chapter 5, and I'm going to read verse 13. What does Paul say here? For brethren, ye have been called unto liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. What does he say? But use liberty to the occasion of the flesh? No, do you not use liberty to the occasion of the flesh? So here Paul is actually saying, look, 
You have been given liberty, but do not use it to the occasion of the flesh. What does that mean? The flesh wants to sin. Do not use it to sin. This liberty that you've been given does not give us the right to live in sin to win somebody else for Christ. Amen? It does not give us that liberty. It's not for the flesh. So yes, it does not mean what so many so Christians say. If we compare scripture with scripture, we see clearly that Paul is saying, look, do not use liberty for the occasion of, to the flesh, but by love serve one another. Thus Paul's liberty was not the liberty to serve the flesh in any way. Paul also thought that believers are to abstain from all appearance of evil. In 1 Thessalonians, and I want to go there as well. 1 Thessalonians. Okay, where are we here? Chapter 5, verse 22. Abstain from all appearance of evil. What does that mean? That is one of the strictest form of separation. Abstain from all. These, it says, from all appearance of evil. Not just from some appearance of evil. We are not supposed to participate in any evil thing whatsoever. Amen? Freely, we are not supposed to do this. We sin as Christians sometimes. We shouldn't. And I know I say that a lot. And we don't have to because we have the Holy Spirit living on us. So Paul says abstain from all appearance of evil. So this definitely teaches us when Paul is saying he became all things to all people, it doesn't mean he participated in what they did, the sin they committed. Amen? Because he's teaching we shouldn't do this. So he would have not done that in any way as well. And Paul would not have done anything contrary to this in his own life and ministry, I wrote down here. For instance, you know, 1 Corinthians talks about 11, and I'll go there to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. We're there close by just a little while ago. For, verse 14 And not even nature itself teach you that if a man have long hair, it is a shame unto him. Now, there's a lot of people that say, well, you know, Jesus had long hair, so we need to have long hair to be able to win people for Christ. Well, you know, the Bible says it's a shame for a man to have long hair. And I don't think Paul had long hair either. I don't think he would have done that. And I know there was one missionary that actually went to a country where almost everybody wore long hair, and he al allowed his hair to grow long, just to fit in so he could win some people for Christ. Okay, I'm not going to talk against that. If that worked, but I don't think he participated in different sins. But I don't think Paul even allowed his hair to grow long, because that would have been a shame and would have had the appearance of evil, in my view. Thus, when we compare Scripture with Scripture under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, we are able to interpret the Bible correctly, accurately, and to know sound doctrine. So I think that's important. When I got saved and I started serving, I remember asking the pastor, I says, how will I know which doctrine is right? How will I know? And I told the pastor, look, Okay, I got saved in this church, and we're an independent Baptist church. And I believe you teach the truth, because I look in the Bible, and it all fits together. But I said, there's so many different churches around here. And when I talk to the people of those churches, they all say they have the right doctrine. And yet the doctrine doesn't all agree with what we teach. So how will I know that I have the right doctrine? And that's a question I ask. So I think it's a good question we should ask ourselves. I think it's a good question when we ask ourselves this, I should say. And he gave me a book, and he said, study this book. And the book's called, How to Study the Bible. 
And there's a lot of things that help you out to how you can interpret the Bible the right way. But you got to look where these books come from as well. What kind of author? What his belief is, of course. But it makes so much sense after you study it yourself. I can't do justice in preaching it here. If you study it yourself, God can give you so much more understanding than just listening to me preach on it. Amen? I believe that with all my heart. And so I started studying it, and God gave me convictions of what doctrines are the right doctrines. So when my grandfather asked me once, as I was talking to him about the Bible and about salvation, and he says, okay, you believe you, you are preaching the truth. Is that right? I said, yes, grandfather, I do. So you believe the church you go to, they preach the truth. Yep. He says, well, I believe the church I go to preach it to the Bible as well. And I've always thought it was true. He says, look, now I'm just going to name some names here, he said. He says, there's three different churches of God here close to our place. And he lived in Mexico. So that was here in Alma, we have two different ones. There, there was three different ones that call themselves the church of God. They all say they're right. And they all differ. He says, then we have the Kleinemeine, which is, I don't know how to even say that in English, but then he named up all the other ones the German people have there. And then he named up the ones he knew about the Spanish people. He says, everyone uses the Bible. And all of them say they're right. Now, I want you to tell me today, Henry, which one is right? That was a tough question for me. He says, I want you to tell me today which one was right, which one is right. And at that time, I was studying the book on how to study the Bible, how to interpret the Bible correctly. And I think God, God gave me the Holy Spirit when I got saved, and God there gave me an answer for my grandfather. And I said to my grandfather, look, I think all of the Bible is true from front to back. I do believe some people interpret it the wrong way because they don't take the whole context. He says, but I'm not even going to try to explain that to you. I'm just going to explain it this way, I said. If we preach the Bible the way God says it, without changing it according to our thinking, even if we have to change according to what the Bible says, then I believe we have the truth. But if we try to use the Bible to, and try to change the Bible according to our way of thinking, that's when we're wrong. Because the Bible is always right. And we can lots of times be wrong. Amen? We always have to change what the Bible says, not try to change the Bible to what we think is right. Amen? That is important. And my grandfather somehow understood that. And he did accept Jesus Christ a little bit after that. God had to do a lot of things to get him there, but it did happen. Amen? It did happen. He was almost 94 when he got saved. So there's always hope. If there's a person alive, people, if there's a person alive, that's because God still wants to save their soul. Amen? That's something we need to understand. So, but yes, we need to pray that God will give us the right understanding in Scripture that we can interpret the Bible the right way. Now, not only does the meaning of a verse or passage become clear by comparing it with other scriptures, but Bible difficulties often melt away by this means. What do I mean by Bible difficulties? There's a lot of Bible difficulties. A lot of Bible difficulties. If you read the Bible, and this happens to me quite a bit, so when this happens to me, if I've read one part of Scripture and then another part of Scripture talks about the same thing but it says it differently, then I'm starting to think here, okay, now i I got to go to both of these places. Now how am I going to understand this? And, and you know, and how am I going to... So that to me is important. So let me say that again. Not only does the meaning of a verse or passage become clear by comparing it with other Scripture, but Bible difficulties often melt away by these means. Consider, and let's go to Numbers 13. And I, I try not to make it too long here, but Book of Numbers, and that is in the Old Testament. 
and then we're going to go to the book of Deuteronomy, or Deuteronomy, I don't know how you say it exactly, but Numbers 13, and I'm going to read one, verses 1 through 3. It says like this, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Send thou men, that they may search the land of Canaan, which I gave unto the children of Israel. Of every tribe of their fathers shall ye send a man, every one a ruler among them. And Moses, by the commandment of the Lord, sent them from the wilderness of Paran. All those men were heads of the children of Israel. So here we see that the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Send thou men. Now let's look at what Deuteronomy says about this. And that's, uh, that's why I like to compare scripture, because it's talking about the same thing here, but it says it differently. Now you, I, like to, I like those things. That way you can compare. Let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 1, verses 22 and 23. It says, And ye came near unto me, Moses is speaking, he's talking to the Israelites here, telling them what, what, what had happened, he says, And ye came near unto me, every one of you, and said, We will send men before us, and they shall search out the land. And bring us word again by what way we must go up, and into what cities we shall come. And the saying pleased me well, and I took 12 men of you, one of a tribe. So what is the difference here? Well, the count of number says that God ordered Moses. God ordered the spies to be sent by Moses. Whereas the account in Deuteronomy says that the people requested this. The same account. So think about that. I love this when the Bible does this. Why? Because it makes us study a little bit more. What's God saying here? Okay, which account is right? Which account is right? And that's why I said at first here, you know, a lot of times these passages become clear, these difficulties become clear when we actually study it. So which account is right? The people requested it or God ordered Moses to send the spies? Well, if we compare the passages, one with the other, we find that both are true. Both of them are true. Not just one, all, both of them. That's the conclusion you actually get to. And I want to try to explain that. Well, I better, otherwise you guys are going to be confused. Amen? They're both, by comparing the passages, one with the other, we find that both are true. In Deuteronomy, Moses gives the details behind the command given in Numbers 13. That's what we need to understand. Moses gives the Israelites the details behind the command that was given in Numbers 13. So both of them are tr true because he gave the details. The people were hesitant to enter immediately into the land and wanted spies to be sent to find out the situation in the land. God allowed the people to follow their desire and commanded Moses to send the spies. The people wanted this. God said, okay, if you want this, I'll tell Moses to send the spies. I'll let you do what you want. I'll give you your desires. You know, Let's think about that a bit. God actually sometimes allows us to follow our desires. And that can be dangerous, amen? Because our desires aren't always very godly because we live in the flesh. So of course God knew that most of the spies would return with an evil report as we know the story and their unbelief and the unbelief of the nation would result in judgment. So yeah, the fact that God often allows men to pursue their sin and unbelief is a fearful thing. But God does allow it. So both of these are correct because Moses in Deuteronomy says, as giving the account behind Numbers 13. So there's no contradiction 
There is difficulties if you don't look at it and don't understand it, but yes, it makes perfect sense because numbers, the people requested it, God tells Moses to send them, and in Deuteronomy, Moses is just telling the people what had happened in numbers. So plainly, both of them are true. So yes, Deuteronomy 29.29 29 tells us, the secret things belong unto the Lord, or God, but those things which are revealed belong unto us and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of this law. So yes, the secret things belong unto the Lord our God. We will never understand all the scriptures. We will never be able to interpret everything or understand everything. Or mine is just too puny for that, especially mine. Especially mine. We will never be able to understand all of it. And yes, the secret things do belong unto the Lord our God. But those things which are revealed belong unto us and to our children forever. So God has given us his spirit. And you know, and I want to read. I have a commentary on the whole Bible by uh, Warren Wearsby. And he is very good. He is very good. And I, I want to read what he says on this here a little bit. Uh, I love his commentary. He says it like this, and the scripture needs to be compared with scripture, but I'll just read a part here. He says, if the engineering student can grasp the technical terms of chemistry, physics, and electronics, why should it be difficult for Christians taught by the Holy Spirit to grasp the vocabulary of Christian truth? And that is true. If people can understand how to do things, how to work here on this earth and do things, why should it be difficult for us as Christians to understand God's truth? The Holy Spirit wants to reveal it to us, amen? And the thing I love about our God is that he knows our hearts. He knows our minds. He knows if we want to use it for his honor and glory or if we want to use it for wrong. So if he knows that we want to lift up his holy name up on high and we want to honor and glorify his name, he will open our mind to the truth. He promises this in his word. Amen? So yes, he will show us how we can compare scripture with scripture, how we can use context, and then he will reveal the truth to us so we can teach it to others because he knows us. But he also knows those that want to just do it for their own profit. And yes, lots of times they will not have the right understanding. But I want to read a little bit more here of what uh, Warren, we Warren uh, Wearsby says. Uh, he says, yet I hear church members say, don't preach on doctrine. Just give us heartwarming sermons that will encourage us. Wow. <laughs> I've heard that a couple of times. They don't want us to teach on doctrine. But I like what he says here. Sermons based on what? If you don't want it to be on doctrine, on what do you want it based on then? Doctrine is the teachings of God, amen? So it needs to be based on doctrine all the time. Every sermon has to be based on doctrine. And the doctrine of God, the teachings of God, so yeah, and he says, uh, based on what? If they are not based on doctrine, they will accomplish nothing. But doctrine is so dull, people complain. Do we have people in this church that complain that doctrine is dull? Any amens? I can't hear you online, but those that are here, I could. I hope there isn't any aims and amens there. Doctrine is not dull. I just want to say that. And I sure hope we don't have people here in this church that would say that. Not if it is, and then he goes on to say, when they say it's stole, it says, not if it is presented the way the Bible presents it. Doctrine to me is exciting. What a thrill to be able to study the Bible and let the Spirit teach us 
the deep things of God. Amen? To me, that's a thrill. Every time I understand something new, or I hear somebody preach, and I understand something, uh, hear something new that I hadn't heard before or I hadn't understood, it just excites me. Amen? Especially when I see a preacher go up there and start preaching, and it actually looks like this preacher actually believes what he preaches. That excites me. Amen? It just does. And I think, think it should excite us all. I think it should. It should excite us all. And he keeps on going here. I, I, I'd like to read a little bit more. It says, how does the spirit teach the believer? He compares spiritual things with spiritual, just like we saw today. He reminds of us of what he has taught us, relates the truth to something new, and then leads us into new truth and new applications of old truth. So a lot of truth we probably understand. He just puts new truth upon the old truth already. That's what comparing scripture, what scripture does. It doesn't reveal a lot of new thing, things lots of times, but it reveals old truth, puts new truth upon old truth. Amen? And the Bible is true from front to back. But yes, we do need to learn to interpret it the correct way. And I could keep on reading here, but I won't do that for the sake of time. I thank you for your time. And uh, I'm so glad that we can be here tonight. Amen? I'm so thankful that we serve a gracious God, a patient God, and an all-knowing God. I'm so thankful that we serve a God that does listen to the prayers of his children. And uh, I love the way Pastor Friesen always puts it. He always says, but sometimes he says no. <laughs> okay? Uh, he's, I, I heard Pastor Friesen say it so many times. God always answers prayers, but sometimes it is no. And sometimes it is yes. But his answer is always right. And we need to ask him to teach us to accept that as such. Even if he says no sometimes, Accept it as if it's right. Amen? Because he knows what's best for us. And he knows exactly why this church is going through what it's going through. He knows why everyone that is sick is sick. And he knows why this church has been struggling, spiritually wise as well. We haven't been here that long, but I do know the church has been struggling spiritually, and we're still struggling. And you know something? Satan is happy because it is. But God wants us to come together as a church and pray for each other and just give our lives completely over to him and answer our prayers that this church can actually be a testimony to this community. 